Welcome to this webinar, a short introduction to data management plans. This is part of the alternative events for IQMR or not IQMR 2020. Uh, lots more things going on and you all have gotten a number of emails. So I hope uh, you'll have a great time with those events in the following weeks and you're taking uh, advantage of the various office thereof. My name is Sebastian Karcher. I'm the Associate Director of the Qualitative Data Repository at Syracuse University, um, uh, where I'm also a Research Assistant Professor of Political Science. And uh, I've been uh, teaching a data management planning or data management module at IQMR uh, for the last three or four years, and I teach versions of this uh, uh, really around the world, and so we wanted to give a very brief introduction beforehand. We also still have a number of slots for 30-minute consultations on your data management plans. We've always found them uh, really enjoyable, and we've gotten really good feedback from uh, IQMR participants in past years. So uh, if you haven't signed up for one, uh, I encourage you to do so. Uh, so when we talk about uh, data management and data management planning, what, what are we really talking about? Um, this is a definition by the University of Edinburgh, who's one of the first universities who had research data management services um, as a major focus of their library. And they call research data management caring for facilitating access to preserving and adding value to research data throughout the life cycle. Um, there's a lot going on here, and that's what I like about this, um, right? So I, I li really like the idea that you have to care for uh, your data. If you don't care for your data, it may get lost. It may suffer in quality. Um, so, and, and it's a constant activity, right? You later have throughout its life cycle. You care for your data from the moment you start planning for collecting it, uh, until after your research is completed. You facilitate access to it. Uh, your mind immediately will go to data sharing, which is uh, in some areas of the social sciences uh, for qualitative data quite controversial. Um, working at a data repository, I think about this a lot, and I generally think it's a good thing, but facilitating an access to isn't limited to data sharing in the traditional sense. It's also thinking about who needs access to the data um, while you're doing research. Will there be a research assistant? Do faculty members, committee members need access? Uh, are there translators? Are there other team members uh, that need access to the data? Which data do they need access uh, to? How will that access uh, be regulated? How will you ensure that the wrong people don't get access to the data? Um, you want to preserve your data, right? Make sure it's still there. And you want to add value. A lot of what research is, is um, you collect information and then you add a value to it by documenting it, by organizing it, by analyzing uh, this. So research data management encompasses this whole complex of activities. And a data management plan is a document of various lengths. In the US, we typically do two-page data management plans um, that helps you think through this. And you think through this from the beginning of your process. You plan it um, and uh, write it uh, down and then have a document that structures how you conduct uh, research data management activities. Um, why is this so important? Um, number of reasons. First of all, data creation is expensive. It may be expensive because you actually pay people to do things, right? If you have translators, if you have survey companies, uh, those sorts of things. Um, but even if not, if, even if you just, quote unquote, just uh, do field research by yourself, that's a year, two years of your life that you're spending on collecting your data. You definitely don't want to lose it and you want to make the most out of it. Your data are also what will underpin what you publish, um, whether that's your dissertation, your book, uh, your articles, and you want to have a solid foundation on which your research um, rests. Crucially, you want to protect your data from, uh, from loss and destruction. Um, I don't think that needs further explanation. It's all of our nightmare that suddenly the information on which we were hoping to write our book, dissertation, etc 
is irretrievably lost, or at least part of it is. But you may need to think about uh, various things to comply with, right? Um, ethical codes, uh, various professional um, organizations like APSA, ASA, etc., cetera, uh, all have ethical codes that say something about uh, what you should and shouldn't do with data, how you should um, interact with uh, human participants. There may be data protection laws that you need to be aware of in how you organize your data, where you can and cannot store it, what you can and cannot share. You may want to publish in journals that have specific requirements or you uh, may be funded or want to get funded by funding bodies like the NSF in the US or, um, or the European Union programs uh, that have very specific requirements uh, for data sharing, data management, etc. Most importantly though, um, you should do this well because you will thank yourself for it. If you spend some time to think about how do I plan, how do I organize my data, how do I protect my data now, um, the future you in three or five or seven years when you write up your dissertation, finish your dissertation, work on your book proposal, finish your book proposal, will be immensely grateful to pass you if you did this well and if you make your information and data accessible, retrievable, and easy to work with. So what is this with the data management plans? They actually go back to the 1960s and 70s when you had these immensely complex engineering projects, uh, thinking mainly space travel, complex aircrafts, those sorts of things. They collected a lot of data. They needed to figure out how who was collecting the data, who was responsible, where was it sitting. Remember, a lot of this was not in computers, so you actually needed to know where specific tapes were or even hand-recorded data, all those sorts of things. And they found having a document uh, that they could refer to um, that cataloged those data was immensely helpful. And then in the early 2000s, there was a renewed interest in that. And the reason for that is pretty straightforward. We had an immense growth in easily accessible data because now all of this is uh, data uh, are digital. It's much easier to share them. It's much easier to collect large amounts of data. And people were thinking, well, we should uh, really think harder about what we, um, what we do with data, how we collect it, and how we uh, may give other people access to this as much as possible. And so the UK was really early in this. In the mid-2000s, all of the UK funding bodies, uh, the national funding bodies, have uh, started requiring data management plans. And most of them have quite rigorous um, data sharing requirements built in. Uh, in the US, uh, NSF has required them since 2011. And from what we're seeing anecdotally, is looking at them increasingly closely. So if you hear from people who've maybe gotten grant proposals passed in 2015, that experience is not necessarily what you will see in the 2020-21 NSF funding cycles. We find that a lot of program offices in the social sciences and beyond are looking very closely at those data management plans and asking people to uh, fix them, improve them, etc. cetera. Um, this is, uh, also, in the EU, a big topic, the Horizon 2020, the biggest EU funding project, has elaborate data management plan requirements, and so on and so on. Uh, so this isn't a, uh, at all a US-based initiative. If anything, the US is towards the back of the pack among the uh, uh, advanced industrialized countries in uh, requiring it. Uh, so now that you have a little bit of history, wh what actually is uh, a DMP and what's in it? Uh, you'll find a lot of lists, and this is a very abbreviated version. Uh, I have a URL to a checklist that we um, that we assembled at QDR that has, uh, I think, something like 30 or so uh, points uh, below, and the slides will be shared. Um, but just to give you an idea, right, you want to uh, say what data will be collected. So are you collecting interviews? Are you collecting archival documents? Are you collecting both? Are you doing survey research? Uh, and you want to specify how much, in what formats, all those sorts of things. Uh, how are you going to organize uh, that data? And uh, that's particularly helpful for yourself to spend some time on. Um, 
what's uh, your folder structure going to be? What's your uh, naming file naming convention going to be? Are you going to use any database uh, software? Have you thought about that software? Have you thought about longevity of that software? Does that lock you in? Those sorts of considerations. Um, what, docu uh, what documentation uh, will you generate and how? Um, so one thing that we find a lot is that if you collect all this data and then you go back and start documenting, okay, this was on this date and these were the conditions on, during the interview, it's probably a bad idea. You want to collect as much documentation as possible uh, in real time. Um, how will you store the data and protect it during the research? That's both safety against data loss uh, and especially for sensitive data, uh, safety against uh, unauthorized access and that will vary a lot depending on what sort of unauthorized access uh, you worry about and what sort of data you're dealing with but it's a very important topic um, should be covered in uh, the DMP. What will happen with the data after you complete your uh, project? Um, who is going to be responsible for it? Is there some part of the data that you need uh, may need to uh, destroy? Um, or are you uh, moving the data into a data repository um, who will, which is the last point then, uh, facilitate the sharing of the data? Um, mind you, when we talk about data sharing, you typically collect a ton of data, especially during, uh, during your standard qualitative multi-method research project. Not necessarily all of those data are shareable or suitable or something that you want to share. So the, your DMP should specify, okay, I will share these data, I will not share these data, this is why I won't share these data. So a typical example would be, um, I will share transcripts from my semi-structured interviews, I will not share the audio recordings, um, I will not share, say, my ethnographic field notes, but I will share, um, say, uh, photo prompts uh, that I used uh, as part of ethnographic interviews. Uh, and uh, you want to think hard about this, and the funding organizations will want you to think hard about it. What can you share? What's reasonable to share? What's safe to share? Um, and what is reasonable not to share? All of that should be in a DMP, and again, we have a much longer checklist with lots of examples available. Uh, another thing, apart from that checklist to help you, is there's a number of uh, apps for that. The two most common ones is the DMP tool, which is developed by the California Digital Libraries in the US, and DMP Online, uh, developed at the Digital Curation Center in the UK. Uh, they're both international. I think the DMP Online says it has users from 90 different countries. Uh, one of the nice things that they do is they recognize that different funding agencies have different requirements for data management plans. It's very hard for you to keep track of all of these. Um, so uh, they tell you which template to follow, which types of questions to address. So you see here on the left side of my screen, I've pre-selected the NSF, Social Behavioral and Economic Science uh, Directorate, but they have lots of other uh, templates that you can follow and then they like make you fill out text boxes so it's not it won't write your data management plan for you but it will provide tons of guidance and tell you what's important for every uh, sub chapter so to speak of your data management plan. Uh, one thing that I wanted to particularly flag because uh, we often find that people don't think about this hard enough there's a close connection between your data management plan and your IRB ethics review board, however that's called uh, in uh, your country. Um, both of those are typically based on federal or in some other countries university regulations. So you both um, have to comply with these in some level. Um, both of them uh, concern how you collect data and how you interact with human participants. And so you want to make absolutely sure that what you say in your data management plan and what you say in your IRB uh, application aligns, right? You can't tell the NSF in your data management plan, I will share uh, my data from the project completion and tell your participants uh, and your IRB via the informed consent form, only I will ever have access uh, to the information you provide. And this is something that we absolutely see 
uh, in real life scenarios. So this is abs this is not a hypothetical. Uh, be very mindful of that. Uh, related to this is as you write your DNP, we strongly recommend that you take advantage of the local resources that you may have and consult with other stakeholders in your project. Obviously, if you have a project team, you should have a team meeting about it. As an early career researcher, most of you will have uh, maybe a dissertation advisor or committee, uh, but a small team, but you still have stakeholders that you should think about. Uh, one of them is your ethics board or your IRB. Uh, very helpful often is your local uh, IT department. They may offer secure storage uh, that can be very helpful. They may also be aware, aware of specific university rules. So say when you are uh, an, uh, EU based, the GDPR, the uh, data protection uh, regulation may impose certain rules on which companies you can use to, uh, for, for cloud storage if you have personally identifiable data. Your university may have rules about that and your local IT department will very likely be set up for that and will be able to uh, advise you. Uh, if you do a research with a partner organization, uh, you want to have a conversation with them about their uh, expectations. Both are there local rules? Will you, should you uh, uh, run through the equivalent of an ethics board in a country in which you do research, which sometimes will be necessary, sometimes uh, won't be? But also, do they have specific expectations for data handling? And do they have specific expectations for sharing of data? Are they eager for you to share the data? Will they want to review the data before sharing? Do they oppose uh, for you to share the data? Um, all of this is okay, but you will want to know beforehand and it should be in your DMP. And then um, talk uh, to a data repository, especially if, as you hope, uh, as I hope you will, you consider sharing your data. Um, we'll give general advice. You know, those are the conversations, uh, the consultations that I talked about. Um, we'll uh, talk to you how, about how data sharing look like. We'll give you language to include in your data management plan that covers that, that portion about how will data be shared and who is in charge of that. Um, there may also be costs involved in uh, data sharing that you can write into a grant and uh, we'll give you quotes for that. Uh, Again, ideal to do this all at an early stage when you can still change things based on our feedback. Last thing I want to uh, cover is thinking about your DMP as a strategic document. Um, and uh, I think of four audiences that you really write your DMP for. And you can actually have slightly different version of the DMP, and I'll, I'll get to that in a, in a minute. So for most of you, your principal audience will be your funders. So say the NSF or the equivalent uh, in uh, your home country. Uh, what they're really after is impact and often data sharing. So if we get feedback from NSF program offices, almost all of the time their biggest concern with data management plans is that they are not explicit enough uh, about data sharing. So think hard about how you address data sharing and where you don't share data or where you're not planning to share data, um, how you justify that based on sensitivity, access, uh, those sorts of things. Um, your grant, of course, will be peer reviewed at almost all organizations. Um, and there I would uh, encourage you to see your DMP as essentially another two pages that you get in your uh, grant description where you can sh show to your peer reviewers uh, that you're thinking hard about data collection best practices and have a sophisticated um, approach and methodology. Most people don't, uh, reviewers don't read these super thoroughly, but they can raise red flags if you seem careless and they can on the uh, upside also um, give you kudos and, and show that you've really, really thought through the process, especially for, for something like complex field work of how you're going to approach uh, your data, its collection, its storage and organization. Uh, think about your team. And that's something where DMPs can come in incredibly uh, helpful. You may have co-authors, you may have GAs or undergraduate students. 
um, either now or once you transition into a, a faculty uh, role. You may work with translators, you may work with uh, transcribers, you may want to give access to committee members. A DMP uh, can guide you in who has access to the data and how. It can also help you communicate expectations such as how data are organized and how data are kept uh, safe, especially as you uh, work in larger teams, say as if you work with uh, three GAs or so, which wouldn't be uncommon uh, later on. Um, that, that's incredibly helpful. For that scenario, it can actually be helpful to have a Google Doc or otherwise easily accessible version of that document that can be changed over time so that, you, that it reflects changes in your approach. Uh, we sometimes call uh, the DMP a living document because you know, as you go through your research, things change, expectations change, how you plan to do things change, and those can be reflected in that centralized team DMP, which also applies to your future self, right? Your DMP reminds you how you plan to do things um, and allows you to consult a more relaxed, uh, put together uh, version of yourself in the past that thought things through. So once you're in the field, and juggling 20 things at once, you don't have to make on the spot decisions, but uh, you can just um, reflect back and on your original document and on your original plans and then execute those. Um, which brings me back to one of my original points. The DMP is often seen as a bit of, of paperwork, a hurdle that you run through. Uh, what I would encourage you to do is really see it as an uh, principally as a help uh, for yourself and uh, for your collaborators. And only at the second stage uh, uh, hurdle that you have to jump through for uh, the funding or other applications that you have. This is only a very short overview. Uh, there could be much more that uh, I could tell you about this. We also have these uh, consultations. We have a whole online course managing qualitative data that we developed with the SSRC that I that uh, I believe we linked to in one of the emails uh, we sent. So so plenty of places to uh, learn more about this. But for now, uh, I'm going to see if we have uh, some questions. And in the meantime, have my uh, contact info um, on the screen. Currently, not seeing any questions. Um, so the Q&A box should be at the bottom of your screen um, and I'll, I should see whatever you type. Uncomfortable silence unfortunately works much better in a classroom when it's also uncomfortable for you and not just for me. Um, so, uh, one question, um, how often is one expected to update the DMP? Uh, that's a great question. By funders in the US, typically, uh, not at all. Um, in the EU, uh, I think they expect by now something like yearly uh, updates. Uh, so this is kind of a fluid field. I don't know if this will change in the uh, in the U.S. Um, personally, I think uh, looking at it and seeing if you need to update it about once every six months to a year is about the right approach. Um, 
then we have a question from uh, Paul. Um, uh, what are the uh, common pitfalls scholars suffer in constructing a DNP? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, I would say lack of specificity uh, is um, just a missed chance uh, writing in generalities rather than uh, writing specifically. You know, I'm conducting uh, semi-structured interviews. I'm going to uh, save them as dog. Uh, as Word docx files, uh, I'm going to record them with XY device. I'm going to uh, um, those kind of things as explicit as possible. And then, as I mentioned, for the program offices, uh, they will often um, complain about lack of specificity for data sharing. Um, so, um, Colin asks. Uh, what do you do, or does it get more complicated for interview data where you promise confidentiality? Um, this is, uh, it gets a little bit more comp uh, complicated, but we very often uh, promise confidentiality uh, during um, interviews. And uh, we often recommend uh, that you actually specify in your informed consent whether de-identified, so still confidential data, uh, will be shared. Um, where you do that, you can, you know, you need to de-identify the data, which isn't trivial, but uh, in most cases doable. Um, and uh, where you should also consider giving people an out there, right? So if you ask as a part of your informed consent, can I share your data? And people say no, you don't say, well, then I don't want to talk to you. But then you note that in your documentation, I can't share this data. Uh, you probably want some sort of record with that. Um, uh, there is uh, the Bleich Peckan and interview appendix is a really nice way to to keep track of uh, you know which interviews did you conduct, uh, which uh, for which of these are data available. That's one good way of doing this. So lots of ways to handle confidential data. A little bit more complicated, but but fairly standard, I would say, in the social sciences. Um, uh, how does one factor in uncertainties once you start collecting data? What happens if your plan uh, change? Uh, great question. Uh, your plans will change. That's not even really an if. Uh, and what you do is uh, you adjust your data management plan. That's when I was referring to it as a living document. That's exactly the scenario I was talking about, um, right? Um, and uh, that's perfectly fine, right? The data management plan isn't designed to shackle you. It's designed to help you. Um, what are the norms or expectations for data protection? Is encryption required? Would a university provide box Dropbox account be sufficient? Um, that really uh, varies both by country and by types of data. Um, for uh, relatively harmless data, um, uh, encryption, like specific additional encryption, is typically not uh, required. If you think if you have very sensitive data, uh, you want to be very careful with encryption. Uh, generally, Box and Dropbox accounts are quite safe, especially when you have multi-factor authentication enabled. And universities will have specific rules about uh, using them for research data in most places. Uh, Cloud storage providers are also a particular area where you need to be really careful when you are in the EU because there are uh, specific rules concerning cloud storage and personally identifiable data. So I've seen a lot of uh, EU countries saying you can't put uh, uh, identifiable research data in Dropbox. Um, so um, that's uh, that's kind of the general rule. But again, this is one of the places where you really need to make sure that, that you're complying not just with best practices, but also with uh, what your university uh, is saying. Um, then there is one more question that I'm uh, seeing, uh, which is, um, can you talk through the advantages and disadvantages of using software to manage qualitative data? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. And there's a lot of different approaches that you can take for software. Generally, um, software app sites are, they 
uh, often help you be more systematic and they speed up your tasks. The downside are uh, it may take you some time to learn them. Uh, it may cost you money to acquire them. And uh, there is some risk of uh, lock-in, right? If it's a proprietary software and there's only one format, you'll have to um, stay with uh, that particular software. Um, so that's very generic. Um, so one thing that I would encourage you is try to find software that you find very intuitive and, and user-friendly. Think about pain points, right? So one thing, if you take a lot of images, say you do archival research, right? Like keeping track of those is a pain point for lots of researchers. So finding software that helps you describe those images, keeping notes with them, quickly view them, those sorts of things, it's going to be very helpful. And there are a couple of really nice tools uh, out there. Um, if you have tons of interviews and you do coding-based qualitative research, at this point, you almost certainly will want to use some sort of qualitative data analysis software like in Vivo or Atlas DI or um, other tools. But then you're already looking in Vivo, Atlas, very expensive software, fairly complex software. So, so you're starting to look uh, at uh, trade-offs. Um, uh, right, uh, which brings me to the lock-in factor. Uh, if you're using software, especially if you're using software that isn't super well established yet, uh, start out by looking how easy is it to get your data out of this and move to another alternative uh, software or just to plain uh, files. Don't get locked into a tool that's really new and looks really shiny, uh, but you can't easily get your uh, data out of. Uh, open source is often a good way to guarantee this but closed source tools uh, can still have good export in standardized formats, uh, so, so it's not a necessary condition. These are great questions. Uh, and we're uh, a little past half the hour. I think this was, this was great. Thank you so much for coming and uh, for answering questions. Uh, we'll put the slides up and put the recording up in the next couple of days and then send an email uh, to uh, the entire list. And again, I hope you enjoy uh, the coming weeks of alternative IQMR 2020 uh, activities. Thanks so much, everyone, and uh, stay safe. <laughs>